Welcome to Oceanside Chat. This podcast was created to inspire, motivate, and provide insight through industry professionals sharing personal stories, career aspirations, and practical advice. Our guest, Susan Spence, the Vice President of Sourcing, Procurement, and Accounts Payable at FedEx Services, has been combating supply risks for over 35 years in the logistics and aerospace industries. Time to get your feet wet in the business world and join us down by the water as we have an Oceanside Chat. Season 2, Episode 4, Risk Management in Supply Chain. Welcome to Oceanside Chat. I'm Helen Wang, the host and editor of the program. Thanks for joining us today. The supply chain system has no shortages of challenges, uncertainties, and crises. When you try to solve them, blind spots, triggers, and shocks have different outcomes and degrees of likelihood and impact. In other words, crises lead to unexpected path. There are two types of crises. The first type, sudden crisis, are unexpected events beyond management control, including but not limited to nature disasters and terrorist attacks. The other type is a smothering crisis which escalated from internal problems and inattention by management. Examples are product defects, bribery, and mismanagement. According to the Institute for Crisis Management, for the first time in the past 31 years, sudden crisis in the year 2020 accounted for more than 50% of the worldwide stories they tracked. The upward trend for the sudden crisis undoubtedly worsened the supply chain outlook. Year 2021 was the record-breaking for supply chain disruptions. In the middle of pandemic, winter storms slammed Texas food supply chain. Suez Canal brokerage for more than 350 ships. Then cyber attacked Colonial Pipeline, just to name a few of them. For supply chain professionals, we must face the obstacles Supply chain veterans and executives who have lived through the impossible times would tell you, never waste a good crisis. For this episode, I invited our own board member from the Institute for Supply Chain Excellence and Innovation at UC San Diego to discuss the hot topic of supply chain risk management. Let's welcome Sue Spence a long-term chief procurement officer at United Technologies and currently the vice president of sourcing, procurement, and accounts payable at FedEx Corporation. Sue, welcome. Thank you, Helen. Very excited to be here and uh, excited to talk about my favorite topic, which never gets old, apparently, supplier risk management. Are you a sunrise, daylight, twilight, or nighttime? I used to be nighttime and now I'm sunrise. (laughs) (laughs) Why is that? What has changed? I'm older and um, I tend to fall asleep earlier than I used to. I think it's just my vintage. Um, And the sun happens to come in to my room purposely, windows open. Um, Typically, I can't wait to get started with the day. I know that sounds a little cheesy, but I'll say it anyway. But I can't do uh, very, very late nights anymore because um, I'm getting up there. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, morning is so uh, hopeful and optimistic at beginning of the day. What is one of the best or most worthwhile investment you have made since the pandemic? So I hate how it happened because there's such pain and grief in the world, but Um, The pandemic allowed me to come back to Connecticut, where I spent my entire life, raised my family, where my family still remains. I've been able to work for two years now from Connecticut. FedEx, my division is hybrid. So we actually opened our offices yesterday and we're going to remain hybrid, which means a couple of days a month in the office. So I've been allowed to be back home in a, a home I bought about three years ago. Uh, that I really love that's in a beautiful town. I'm able to be near my very elderly parents, 91 and 92. 
which is helpful as they age and um, just see more of the people I love outside of the work. So it's been a blessing in disguise because it was a way to keep the wonderful job I have, uh, do it well, but also have the family and friends more frequently in my life, which has been wonderful. Yeah. The best investment is quality time with family. For more than 28 years, you worked for UTC, United Technologies Corporation in the aerospace industry. What was the most significant learning from the experience that shaped your leadership style? So about eight years into my career, actually right before I had my oldest daughter, who is going to be 29 years old this year, hard to believe, I went into a rotational program uh, where for two years and every six months, I rotated into a job I had never done before. It was a talent development program. And it ripped me out of my comfort zone, which had been purchasing and buying and put me into jobs such as a financial analyst, HR person, a shop floor supervisor in a union environment, and the most wonderful experience uh, managing, teaching, continuous improvement. So um, being in a rotational program and doing it as a brand new mother who wasn't quite sure I could even be a working mother and do that very well, everything was changing. And so it taught me to be a lot more adaptable and resilient um, because the comfort zone was gone. The company gave me that wonderful opportunity to do that. And it really did, especially the continuous improvement learning reshaped my brain. I say that phrase a lot. It completely changed my outlook on problem solving and how I think about the world around me. Oh, fantastic. You joined the FedEx in 2013. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, have your families used the UPS since then? Well, even FedEx uses UPS. I won't say we do it by choice. Um, the most interesting thing in my first 90 days was driving into our corporate office where our CEO resides and having the big brown truck in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> Shippers choose their carriers, right? As the consumers, we don't. Uh, I absolutely appreciate our competitors, UPS, Amazon. I think they all do a wonderful job. The world needs all of us, right? There's so much volume that one person can handle it anyway. And we've always said that, especially with the pandemic. I've read books about all of them too. Um, there's things you can learn from everybody, including your competition. That says a lot about supply chain, not only competition, right? There's also a lot of collaboration and cooperation within the industry. So as the vice president of sourcing procurement accounts payable at FedEx, how many people work in your organization? We are right now at a little over 200. We have some hiring going on. Mostly in Memphis, we have team members in Pittsburgh, Harrison, Arkansas, uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, that does not count some international sourcing and procurement folks that um, don't work for me directly, but we do collaboration with them. What are the quality skills and the professional backgrounds are commonly shared among them? Well, what we look for and we coach for if folks aren't where they need to be in it, Every skill, um, technical, interpersonal, we put under four categories. Uh, category management, which is huge, and that's the holistic managing of the service or the goods that you buy. Data analytics is big. Program management is huge, and emotional intelligence. So those are our four key skills that we would probably put everything else under. You really can't operate well and be successful on our team if you're good at three, but not at one. you got to really have all four of them there. And there's ways that we uh, help people acquire that. We have our own university. We custom wrote our own curriculum. We have tracks for that. That is something we feel strongly about that has helped our folks help deliver the value every day. That's a very comprehensive list of things that you're looking for. Thanks for sharing that. How would you describe the culture of your organization? So my organization sits inside of FedEx. The FedEx culture I'll start with um, FedEx has a very famous saying we call the purple promise. And that means I will make every FedEx experience outstanding. It was very curious to me when I joined, it sounded a little bit like an advertisement and I wasn't quite sure having never worked there before, if that was just what we said or what we do. And I found out that is what we do. So the team and the team members at FedEx, and there's over 500,000 of us worldwide, uh, really will run through walls for each other and the customer. And so that's the backdrop of the culture, which is wonderful. And that has been in place from the time the chairman started the company. 
Um, for my team in particular, we had a transformation journey to go to, to go through rather in 2013 to transform from just a tactical reactionary back office group to a transformative group that does all the world-class characteristics thing we know is necessary for managing the supply chain. The culture on my team, extremely high expectations. Any one of my people will tell you that is true. We're extremely transparent and unfiltered in what we expect from people. We're extremely transparent and unfiltered about when we think people need to improve and what their strengths are. Um, talent reviews, talent succession, talent development is huge and key to us. So um, high, high, high expectations with a lot of support. And for the folks that do well, there are so many more career opportunities once they've worked for our team versus before. And it's not because I say so, it's because they say so. Uh, and they eventually leave and go on a bigger and better. And that's a wonderful thing. I would like to move forward with today's topic. So what's in your mind when I mention the word risk? It's present every day. It is um, unavoidable. It is manageable. But that doesn't mean that it can be gotten rid of, if you know what I mean. Removing mm-hmm. risk is not a phrase in my head. Surviving risk, right? And doing the things to give yourself the best chance to survive what is going to happen is key. I've been thinking about, and one of the things you and I spoke about a few weeks ago is if you had to come up with an analogy, what would it be? And I thought a lot about that. And then I decided on one that is occupying the rest of my brain. And that is being the daughter of elderly parents who have done a wonderful job saving their money to not be a burden on their children, but then helping them in their journey to long-term care, for instance. So the more I thought about it, the more I drew an analogy about what are the things that um, eventual elder care and aging has to do with risk is number one, it's unavoidable, right? Absolutely, all of us are gonna age. We're gonna lose our physical and mental capabilities, some sooner than others. It is inevitable, nobody lives forever. And I think about what is the preparation to be ready and to have that be less traumatic than it otherwise would be. And as I think about risk with work, it's all about preparation, right? So to be ready for the elder phase of our lives for ourselves or our parents, we have to prepare our financials, our homes. We got to prepare our children and other family members who may be really uncomfortable thinking about what may happen. They say may, but will. Uh, it's inevitable. And so the conclusion I come to is if you do the most planning possible when you're strong, it's just better. It's easier. You can clearly think through the impacts, right? The things that I know personally, my siblings and I are doing to try to give our parents the best information, even if they don't understand everything anymore. It's hard to do that when things are really, really deteriorating or when our own minds aren't where they need to be. So It's so stressful. We're thrilled to have our parents still, but it's more stressful if dad's 95 and there's no money left to pay. And nobody thought to sit and think about where's all the papers? How does he manage the bills? And to do that when things are so far gone, because maybe you just didn't want to think about that time of life. It's just so much harder. I had a wonderful boss who used to say, failing the plan is a plan to fail. And the first time he said it to me, I really didn't like it very much (laughs) because I was in his office explaining why I didn't have a plan. (laughs) So it was not used in a a comfortable way, Um, but I like that phrase a lot. And certainly with supply risk management, before the disaster happens, you've got to pretend that it's about to happen when you are a little calmer, maybe when you're not in a panic. So um, some people call that scenario playing war games. Uh, whatever. But um, even at FedEx, the first time I faced a hugely stressful risk situation was in the middle of something we weren't ready for. So it was a bit of a panic, but we let that um, emotional experience or what I like to call it, make quite the memory and impression. Okay. Now let's imagine that's going to happen in this category, in that category. And then we started to build about it because my team members who did a wonderful job. Uh, I just said, guys, I don't know about you. I can't go through that every time. (laughs) 
I'm going to die. I'm not going to be able to manage it. And I don't want to manage that way. I'd rather be smart than lucky, right? So the analogy to growing old, both with elder parents or family members, and then yourselves, for me, it works, right? Because I, I do think about it in the same way. Yeah. Well, that's a very good one. And it's easy to understand. It also gave us a lot of hope in terms of risk is coexists everywhere with us all the time. But if you plan ahead, right, part of the risk can be managed. And I would love to show the poll result for the first question. How do you feel about the outlook for the world? It's a single choice. We have uh, 75% uh, are saying concerned and only 25% saying positive. Yeah. And there's nobody choose either worried, which is most uh, worst case scenario, or optimistic, which is the best case scenario. So most people are somewhere in the middle, but more people are on the concerned side. So do you want my outlook? Yeah, please. I'm going to be in the 0% and that's not worried. Of course, we're concerned. Wow. I am still optimistic. Why in the world am I optimistic given everything going on? It feels like we can't get a break. Um, I like to study human history. I like to study how people figured stuff out. And we always, always figure it out somehow. It doesn't mean that um, there's no stress when we go through it or heartbreak, but um, the human spirit is just an amazing thing. And I think I was far more pessimistic when I was younger, right? And more optimistic now. But I think when you've worked for over three decades, like myself, uh, you see some stuff. But the things that I remember, frankly, and that stick with me is how people pulled things out against all odds and were able to persevere. I'm reading a wonderful book by Angela Duckworth called Grit, Power of Perseverance and Resiliency. Maybe that's on my mind. We figure it out because we have to figure it out. We can't just go crawl under the covers, even though once in a while, sometimes we do <laughs> so we can rest. I'm optimistic because I think most people are good. And I think the human spirit rallies. Look what's happening with Russia and Ukraine right now. Look at the outpouring of support, right? It's still pretty tough going and very, very scary, of course. But just in the last week, things that countries and companies would not even consider and look what they're doing. So that is encouraging to me. And it makes me incredibly optimistic because people are good, even when the world is bad. That's fantastic. And today's topic is supply chain risk management. I thought it might be helpful to offer a concept or definition that help people frame it. So supply chain risk management is a process of taking strategic steps to identify assess and mitigate the risk to the integrity, trustworthiness of uh, products and services within the end-to-end -end supply chain. And our audience loves stories. And I consider learnings from real-world example the most valuable gift. Sue, could you share one with us today, please? Sure. The one I'd love to share is the one that got my own brain going on supplier risk, especially as it comes to FedEx. And it was something I talk about quite a bit. It was an incident that happened when I was there about six months. If you've ever seen a FedEx plane, we have a lot of them, over 700 aircraft. We spend three to 4 billion a year on jet fuel. And in our Memphis Worldwide Hub, which is the biggest in the world, we have a wonderful, wonderful supplier. And we basically have one source of fuel in Memphis, you cannot truck that much over the road. You'd break the roads and no one has a fleet that big. So the thing that happened, U.S. refineries are old and they're dirty and things break, right? And not everything's automated. A well-meaning employee at the supplier had an issue and there was a very critical single point of failure piece of equipment that broke and it stayed broke for a while. So what I learned was that at the time, while FedEx Express had a wonderful business continuity disaster recovery plan, you can tanker in as much fuel as you can get your hands on. So you never run out. But my team at the time did not have what I would consider the basic building blocks of risk inventory management in place. So we had a bit of a scramble and our supplier worked very closely with us to put things in place that my experience says should have been like, how much inventory do you have? in fuel? How many days of fuel do you have? 
and understanding if the refinery that pumps fuel through the pipeline to the airport goes offline for months and months, how long does it take to barge that fuel up the river? I learned things about there has to be a certain river height to barge fuel up the river. Um, you have to have barge contracts in place. So as I alluded to why I'm optimistic, people figured it out. We figured it out. We were never going to go dry. The supplier would not let us go dry, but the toll it took and the stress it took was something I never wanted to repeat again. So from there, we built a playbook for business continuity and disaster recovery that we then spread to a bunch of the other categories of services and goods that we buy. And the first lesson there was that when you have 20 to 30,000 suppliers, you can't risk manage everybody. So a very, very important thing that we did was to segment the supply base and the categories and have a real deep conversation about who can shut us down how hard would it hit us and how probable is it for us to hit us? We developed an entire supplier risk mitigation process. Uh, once we decided who to worry about, then we developed tools. And oh, by the way, I didn't get a blank check to do this. And I didn't hire a bunch of people to do this. We did it with the tools we had, the people we had. And we developed a monitoring system so that we could understand when, not if, when that bad thing happens, how hard is it going to hit us? Uh, we will know what our inventory levels are. We will have sources lined up. If we're single source, we'll know what we have to do to get a second source, or we'll have a second source from the beginning and not wait till then. It's served us very, very well. Um, but even when you have a great plan, new things happen. Uh, about four months before the Colonial Pipeline issue, happened, we started rolling out our tier two risk management plan. What did that mean? For the 98 or so suppliers that could shut down FedEx, if we didn't have a plan that could hurt us badly, we started rolling out a measurement on their tier one plan. So my suppliers, suppliers have to have a very solid business continuity and disaster recovery plan because that's very, very short time for pipeline breaks. As we started to roll this out, there was a real discussion with the tier one suppliers who very well knew how we manage the risk that we have with them, but starting to get them to roll it out to their suppliers wasn't as automatic as you think. And um, one interesting thing about the pipeline is, although all our fuel suppliers are dependent somewhere on a pipeline, not that they didn't think about it as a critical supplier, but the questions we ask them to make sure that we're covered with risk from our tier one, they hadn't yet asked them of the pipeline guys. The Colonial Pipeline gets hit with a cyber crime. It shuts it down. We actually survived that one pretty well. We had more issues with diesel than we did with jet. But um, that goes to having really good relationships with our suppliers and understanding because we have our own internal disaster recovery plan, how to get the trucks and the people to the right place. And we did not have an impact, but taught us some things about maybe we have to strengthen the questions that we ask our suppliers as they evaluate their suppliers, um, more cyber questions, for instance. So it's all a consistent learning process. Um, and underpinning all of it is assuming the worst case scenario, being paranoid so that you can play through again, when you're strong and not in a panic, right? Remember the analogy with elder care? You play through it when you have time to really think about it and then refine the plan. It's, it's way better to do that proactively than to do it when you're in the middle of it, when you just don't have time to breathe. So if I understand your last point, right, there's an old saying, fix the roof while the sun is shining. Yes. Yeah. Our roof had rain pouring in it back in 2013. Um, I had been there a few months. So you learn that. It was really about, I like to call asking the stupid questions. So why is uh, nine days of inventory a good number? What's the data and the science behind that? But the time it was, well, it's kind of how we always did it. So it's one, one benefit you have as a new person in organization or an outsider coming in to lead it is you get to ask the dumb questions. And sometimes I just don't know. And sometimes it's, I don't understand. I give a lot of credit to the team who would never let the business be impacted. They'll work around the clock before they let that happen. But I used to tell them it shouldn't be this hard. If we're planning, if we have tools, and if we logically think through what could happen and ask what if. 
And I attribute that to the continuous improvement background that I referenced before. Thinking through those things and understanding root cause and solid corrective action and what we like to call mistake proofing. Is there something that can be put in place, a countermeasure, so that when, not if, this happens again, it won't be as bad, right? And that's kind of our iterative process we follow. I would like to share one of the poll question results. And the question is the biggest risk in supply chain. It's a multiple choice. Let's see here. So there's 50% saying supply shortage. It's probably very timely. Right now we do deal with a lot of supply shortage. And the second highest is single sole source supply. The example you just gave us earlier about the refinery, that's a perfect example. And followed by capacity misalignment. That's interesting because we talk about the capacity planning within the semiconductor industry two weeks ago. That was a very hard call for capacity. And then uh, cost increase. Mm. Uh, that's a good one because, Sue, you must have something to share with us in terms of cost. The next one is better relationship and a regulation policy change. Cyber attack, about 27%. So that gives a snapshot about how much is going on. It's pretty busy in terms of risk yeah. management. It's interesting. I see supply shortage. I don't think of that as a risk. I think of that as a result. We have mm -hmm. it because of these other things. The one I think is missing, although I'm sure people thought about it, is a lack of visibility, right? The lack of transparency, tier one, two, three, four, five. Then the question becomes, well, how far do you go? None of us have perfect transparency below tier one. There's tools, there's wonderful companies out there that can help you get there. But driving a mindset about supplier risk management by demonstrating to your suppliers, what we do is we say, you guys know what we do because we do it to you. Oh, by the way, those 98 critical suppliers that have about half of my 15 billion to spend, most of them are customers too. So that makes it fun and ironic. It, it's helpful to be able to demonstrate to a supplier that's also a customer, here's how we do it. So it should make them feel better about us as a supplier. But also just not having the visibility to their suppliers, you count on them. I count on my wonderful 98 critical suppliers to do as good of a job as I think we do, but with theirs. And then tier three, tier four, there's been many cases of lack of visibility. And think about the tsunami over a decade ago. Who knew that two, three, four levels down, everyone's going to the same guy. It was that way with aerospace bearings as well. Turned out to be, I think it was one small family owned company in Winstead, Connecticut. But nobody knew that everybody went to them until something bad happened. Mm -hmm. So I think you got to interrogate down in the supply chain very deeply, not again for everybody, but for your most critical suppliers that if they ran out of the stuff you need, would shut you down. And the relationship thing I think is underestimated. Companies will do everything they need to do contractually, of course. But the people that they're going to go an extra mile for are the ones that treated them well. If you treat them bad, how motivated are they going to go above and beyond for you, right? Yeah. We have a great question from the audience that combined some of the advice you've given. The question is, how did you get your tier one supplier to manage the sub-tier and share their information? One of the special things that we give our tier ones that are our critical suppliers, the 98 companies. We give them a scorecard and on that scorecard are common metrics, meaning we have the same metric areas, but we have a whole section of metrics on their performance and their suppliers. So they're actually measured on the strength of their own business continuity and disaster recovery plan on their own performance. And now, and most recently on the strength of their supply chain, right? We are very clear, transparent. We actually let our suppliers help set the goals, but they cannot be a platinum supplier if they're doing nothing on that. When we talk to them about it monthly, quarterly, yearly, we bring it up. And by the way, the scorecard performance counts for them or against them in the next time we award it. So it's meaningful to them. We don't always have contractual language around, you must have a BCDR for tier two. We haven't gone that far, but we expect them to not shut us down. And it's not just, please don't ever shut us down. It's here's your scorecard. The weight we gave this particular line item, here's the points we gave this particular line item. 
And there's an accountability that they have to talk to us about it. A good supplier is not going to want to negatively impact their customer. Of course not. But we codify it in a measurement system. And again, that's another basic building block of world-class sourcing and procurement. You have measurement systems. You have robust processes. You have accountability. It is not just the last bad thing or good thing your supplier did because that's unfair, right? What about a supplier love to provide everything the customer is asking for, including all the protection, risk mitigation plan, you know, but what if they're saying it all going to cost me more? So come back to this question about a cost earlier. How would you navigate something like yeah. that? I have never had a supplier tell me that. Doesn't mean that my team hasn't. If that were said to me, I would say I am paying for 100% on-time delivery. 100% quality at this price. So if you have no risk management process or business continuity and disaster recovery plan, then how are you guaranteeing me 100% quality and delivery? And because we're realistic, we know that stuff happens. And so I need to know when stuff happens to your company, it's happened to my company, how will you recover so that you can hold up your contract? We all know you can't do it if you have no way of managing that. So it should not cost more. It's more costly not to do it. And then I guess you could have someone that just still may not want to cooperate. And so this argument will work well when you can do it. Well, since I can't get you to share your plan or even talk about your plan, think about your plan, my responsibility as an officer of FedEx is to mitigate the risk for my company. And in this case, it's going to mean I bring on another supplier. I pull away business or I resource it completely. That usually gets attention. Haven't had to do that. Have had to say it once, but it was understood. I don't like self-source where I don't have to have it. And I've had plenty of it in my life, but um, make me comfortable that I don't need to bring another competitive years on board because when, not if, when the bad thing happens out there, you're gonna have it covered, right? So I think you just have to be transparent and open. And the first time I had these kind of conversations that happened to be with the jet fuel company that we had the issue with, their feedback to me is that no one's ever talked like this to us, not in a bad way. No one's ever explained it that way. No one's ever been that unfiltered. And I appreciated that. And when I was talking to the most senior people at that company, I said, listen, I need to tell our CEO and his direct reports every day what the status is of this major, major supply chain issue. And I want to speak for you. Now, how can I explain and give them confidence if I don't have any? People will typically come around to that. Help me explain it. If you kind of turn it around on folks, it's like, how am I going to explain this? I, and I find most people are good. Most people are smart. Most people want to serve their customer. This kind of conversation happens a lot, especially under the, the environment that we're facing today. Lots of risk just keep coming up. The earlier um, example you share is basically the risk strategy needs to be part of the business plan, right? Yeah. Whether you are a customer, you're a supplier, you are a company by yourself, the risk needs to be mitigated along the supply chain. So either your supplier help you to mitigate it, or you will have to find a way, including no longer stay with a single source, and you may have to diversify. The risk is out there and yes. have to be managed. It's a question for the supply chain partner. How do we do this collectively in a most efficient way? Right. I'm going to stick with the same example because jet fuel just gives you amazing opportunities every few months for something going on. After we kind of got our basic supply risk mitigation plan together for jet fuel and then kept refining it and tweaking it, that's a special one where we had our supplier, you know, risk management plan, the very beginnings of it, but it was still wasn't really connected into the business. So at FedEx, Air Operations does a wonderful job. It's such an impressive organization, but we didn't connect what our supplier was doing to what FedEx was doing. I'll give you an example with tankering. Tankering is when you bring in fuel from other markets. You could do it for economic reasons because you have cheaper fuel in one market versus the other, or you could do it because you have a supply chain shortage. We have a situation where rightly so our air operations folks were bringing in less expensive fuel from one market into another. 
but they didn't have the insight that we only had a certain number of gallons per month in that out market under contract. And so they drained our allocation two weeks into the month. And then we had the scramble. We figured it out, but we realized we didn't connect our plan to theirs. So one of the ways we do it now is war game scenario. We're supposed to do it once a year. It did not happen for about a year and a half during COVID, but we bring the supplier, our team, our air operations people together, and we do a tabletop exercise. Mm -hmm. Um, This past year, we did it in October. It was really interesting because we have a military fellows program where Air Force, Marines, Army, Navy come and spend a year at FedEx. Their logistics officers are incredibly brilliant on brave men and women, and they come to learn with us and we learn from them. So we actually had a better tabletop this year because of the improvement to the process they brought. The teams will go in a room, they'll have a problem thrown at them like an earthquake under Memphis. And this year we had the special pleasure of saying, and what if the pipeline broke? Yeah, (laughs) the pipeline didn't break physically, but it got shut down, right? Getting that plan tested with all the stakeholders and parties, including the suppliers in there, because we're going to inevitably be finding a weak point. And we find a weak point every time. And I always do hope we find a weak point because there's no way that plan is ever going to be perfect because things happen. Again, we're doing that not in the middle of peak season, right? This was in October, not in the middle of the disaster, but we're more ready for the disaster. The other thing we have going for us is because FedEx cares and has humanitarian aid and disaster relief all over the world, it's a lot of the same team members that we kind of put on high alert when we have an issue. Just about two years ago, when we had to find PPE and get it to our 500,000 team members all over the world, I stood up a 10-person team. I pulled some folks from other jobs on my team to go scour the world and find this stuff because, frankly, our distributors were not having any luck either. We just convened the disaster recovery process and protocol that we have when there's an earthquake, a fire, hurricanes, and it's kind of the same urgency. It's the same calm for planning, and it's really remarkable to watch. There's something in the DNA of FedEx that makes us good at it anyway. But reconnecting suppliers to the sourcing people, to the internal stakeholders, all the way up to the guy that's making a call to say, you know what, I'm going to have you not go from Hong Kong to Alaska. I'm going to have you stop here and fuel up because guess what? We just found an issue. And that's how quick we can do it. But there'd be no way to do it if we weren't connected. Likewise, the cost of tankering is not cheap. You're carrying less packages. All the logistics kind of has to be relooked at. And you need a system to do that so that you don't tighten something up in one piece of the supply chain and have a bad result in the other, like tankering in too much fuel from a market where we just burned through our whole allocation in two weeks. All that takes coordination. It takes emotional intelligence. It takes program management. It takes data analytics, all those skills that we talked about. That's fantastic because especially with a large organization with global presence, you need a lot of training, communication, practice. And to your earlier point about continuous learning, because the market condition or the industry also changes, you would only learn by doing sometime versus just on paper. From the World Economic Forum, the 2022 Global Risk Report indicated that economic disruption from the pandemic has created stronger incentives in the vaccinated world, which mostly comprise the advanced economies, to prioritize resilience over cost minimization. So what advice do you have for corporate executives to proactively manage supply chain risk? And what are the considerations to balance supply chain efficiency and resilience? I hear from other CPOs, I can't get the funding I need to really properly mitigate the risk. I think it's cheaper than one would imagine, but sometimes it has everything to do with revealing the vulnerabilities. Because I think that reasonable people, once they really understand how vulnerable the supply chain is, are going to be moved to action. We have wonderful financial risk monitoring tools. We may have a situation with a financially distressed supplier And also they could be a sole source in an area where no one else wants the business because it's not the most profitable with a labor shortage. I mean, 
six or seven different things that are happening. And one thing that I implore our team to do is let's lay that out, not a panicked way, but let's just lay out the facts and then start asking the questions. Given the fact that we have really maybe no leverage in this area, and that's not going to change anytime soon, and our technology enablement solution is years away, might we think about some things that we hadn't thought about before because life has given us examples every year where we squeak by. It's just bringing all the facts together for folks to say the cost of doing nothing is enormous. And frankly, if you do that and you do it well, it's not like you want to say, I told you so, but it, I, I feel like, especially our executives, when you present them with the information in, in a way where it's very clear that this can no longer stand, then I think they'll do the right thing. In doing that, I think it helps the team to think through, are there other alternatives? Are there other ways we can go about this? without sounding the alarm. Part of my high expectations for my group is I expect you to be an expert in your category for sure, but in strategically thinking through these things and asking what if, is there another way to go about this, right? I just feel like we're obligated to let folks know, um, I'm worried about this. It's keeping me up at night. Here's the 10 things we're thinking of doing. And I, I just think it's probably time for y'all to realize and be informed. Even if I'm not asking for an investment, I just want you to be informed. This is a concern. And, and then let our executives know, I want a couple more months to study it to see if we can't figure it out because there's other priorities. People don't naturally know in companies where you're sole source if you don't tell them. And sometimes you're sole source because you hadn't really thought through the risk. Sometimes you're sole source because you have no choice and your supplier owns the intellectual property, been there. I think it's helpful in thinking about it that way. You mentioned about emotional intelligence is one of the key things that you're looking for the talent yes. for yes. your team. I teach emotional intelligence in supply chain at UC San Diego. So uh, personally, I'm also very interested in this topic. Could you tell us a little more in terms of what do you mean emotional intelligence and what specific qualities you're looking for? You remember the Daniel Goldman book? What was that? 25 years ago, I read it. Yeah. And I remember thinking, thank God someone's putting the, put this down because it was hard to know what to call it. We have the emotional intelligence training. We do, we have a course at FedEx and um, part of the coursework was a book called Crucial Conversations. Put it on your list. It is amazing. I've read it twice now and it applies to your personal life, your work life. It talks about when the stakes are high and emotions are running high, how do you get through? How do you have courageous conversations and how do you do it in a way where someone wants to listen versus run away from you? And again, back to the parent thing. I started thinking about this. When folks get older, the intention span is shorter. They forget. We all forget. And so how do I get in there and talk to mom and dad and in the first 60 seconds, get their attention and keep their attention? It's really hard, right? I've yeah. learned that FaceTime with older people is very valuable versus on the phone because the processing is slowed down. So the crucial conversations around our you know, office or our virtual office, what is it that's important to the person I'm talking to? It's not about my message. It's about how do I connect to something that's meaningful to them? Now, first thing you got to do is know your audience, right? I, I'm forever talking to my team about you could have a category strategy PowerPoint that is suited to me. And you don't just show that to everybody. You have to think about your next audience some of this material might be very relevant, some may not be. And that's more work for sure. But knowing your audience, understanding what's important to them and, and finding that in to appeal to it. So in the case of my sole source supplier, where we've had issues maybe in one of our other hubs, I want to get to the head of operations and say, hey, you know these four issues we had. I want to just tell you a little bit about our chances of getting someone else in this market. They're not very good. And here's some other facts. And here's what's going on with the health of this supplier. What do you say you and I sit down and talk about how can we approach the higher level organization to get some consideration to maybe fund a second source or do something? So I'm appealing to her need to ensure the operation doesn't shut down. I'm appealing to her memory 
of how painful the last couple of near misses were and her intelligence, very intelligent woman. Think about the environment we're in. Think about how little leverage we have and how this is not a very profitable business. So let's not get ticked off. Let's be realistic. And if that's the case now, what practically? Welcome to ISCI's Oceanside Chat, A New Light. This podcast was created to inspire, motivate, and provide insight through industry professionals sharing personal stories, career aspirations, and practical advice. Our guest, Susan Spence, the Vice President of Sourcing, Procurement, and Accounts Payable at FedEx Services, has been combating supply risks for over 35 years in the logistics and aerospace industries. Time to get your feet wet in the business world and join us down by the water as we have an Oceanside Chat. Season two, episode four, risk management in supply chain. Welcome to Oceanside Chat. I'm Helen Wang, the host and editor of the program. Thanks for joining us today. The supply chain system has no shortages of challenges uncertainties and crises. When you try to solve them, blind spots, triggers, and shocks have different outcomes and degrees of likelihood and impact. In other words, crises lead to unexpected path. There are two types of crises. The first type, sudden crisis, are unexpected events beyond management control, including but not limited to nature disasters, and terrorist attacks. The other type is a smothering crisis, which escalated from internal problems and inattention by management. Examples are product defects, bribery, and mismanagement. According to the Institute for Crisis Management, for the first time in the past 31 years, sudden crisis in the year 2020 accounted for more than 50% of the worldwide stories they tracked. The upward trend for the sudden crisis undoubtedly worsened the supply chain outlook. Year 2021 was the record breaking for supply chain disruptions. In the middle of pandemic, winter storms slammed Texas food supply chain. Suez Canal brokerage for more than 350 ships. Then cyber attack, colonial pipeline, just to name a few of them. For supply chain professionals, we must face the obstacles. Supply chain veterans and executives who have lived through the impossible times would tell you, never waste a good crisis. For this episode, I invited our own board member from the Institute for Supply Chain Excellence and Innovation at UC San Diego to discuss the hot topic of supply chain risk management. Let's welcome Sue Spence, a long-term chief procurement officer at United Technologies, and currently the vice president of sourcing, procurement, and accounts payable at FedEx Corporation. Sue, welcome. Thank you, Helen. Very excited to be here and uh, excited to talk about my favorite topic, which never gets old apparently, supplier risk management. Thanks for listening to Oceanside Chat. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you liked it, please share this podcast and stay tuned for our next episode. We'll see you later.